Hi friends, I'm Tim Scora and I welcome you to this eighth in the Embracing series. Uh, I'm here in New York City actually at Trinity Episcopal Church and I'm here with a group of friends. We're just getting to know one another and um, we're here for this eighth in the Embracing series focusing on the teaching of Barbara Crafton and on the theme of forgiveness. We come to Barbara and to this, um, her first presentation, which is um, titled 70 times seven, really? And so Barbara, over to you. Thank you, so nice to be with all of you. I didn't know who was gonna come to this. I know, you know people could sign up and I was just so glad when I heard who it was. Um, so 70 times seven, which comes from, you remember that Peter, um, Peter who, who sort of specialized in saying dumb things to mm -hmm. Jesus so that, so that Jesus could correct him, I <coughs> guess. Um, as far as the gospel writers were concerned, Peter's the kind of straight man to Jesus. And this time he, he wants to know, how many times must I forgive my brother if he offends me? Seven, he hopes. Uh, but no, it's not seven, it's 70 times seven, which is 490, which is, uh, I think, bad news for Peter and, and bad news, unwelcome news for us because uh, I don't know that we could do seven. I think we have a hard time sometimes with one, <laughs> forgiving one time. Mm -hmm. Talking about forgiveness is probably the retreat topic that people most want me to talk about and I assume that that's because they are like Peter. He asked Jesus that because he must have been having some issue about forgiveness and I, everybody has something about that. There's somebody who did something terrible that you can't get past or maybe you did something that you can't forgive yourself for or someone else can't forgive you. So. Um, it's, it's a, I think, a kind of a universal problem. So, so let's think about what Jesus says. He has this huge job for us of forgiveness. And we, knowing ourselves, know that we can't really do it, can't live up to it. So then what do we think? Uh, well, if I can't forgive 70 times 7, 490 times, I, I guess I just can't be a good Christian. I guess I'm just not the right kind of person. And it feels to us like a, uh, a ticket to Jesus' love that we can't afford. Oh, if I have to be forgiving, then I guess I can't come to the party. And the Lord's Prayer kind of reads that way to us. You know, it says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And it sounds to us as if we're being ordered to forgive. You march right in there and don't you come out until you have forgiven him. Uh, is that really what the Lord's Prayer is saying? Is that really what Jesus is saying? Is he saying there's this huge job that you have to do? this job that you actually are not equipped to do. And I'm gonna demand it of you. And if you cannot do it, well, you can't be my friend. And, and I just don't think that that's what we're talking about. I think that if we could back up from the idea that forgiveness is a job that Jesus wants to do and wants us to do, if we could back up from the idea that forgiveness is a job that Jesus wants us to do and instead look at it the way we look at other spiritual gifts, which is that they're gifts, they're not jobs. Mm. Um, all of them are. Uh, prayer, it's a gift, it's not a job. Prayer is not a thing you do so you can get on Jesus' good side. It's, it's a gift from God to you to enable you to do what God wants very much, which is to connect with you to stay with you, to have you stay, and have you live in love close with God. That is God's desire for us. It is why God made us, and it's why we're here. So all of the things that God does with us are, are purposed to bring us closer, not to drive us away. Why would God say, hmm, let me just give them an impossible task that they won't be able to do, and then they won't be able to come to me? 
That would only be if God didn't want us to come to you, but God does want that. God does not want any of us to stay away. And so this, this idea of forgiving as we have been forgiven, maybe what it's saying, maybe what it's saying is if you forgive, you will know what it is to be forgiven. And if you don't, you won't be able to hmm. accept this gift. It's not that I won't give it to you. I'm giving it to you all the time. It's that you won't be able to accept it. It's like if somebody, say, gave you um, a ticket to Hawaii. Here's the ticket. Go and have a wonderful time. And you, you said, no, I, I won't go <laughs> to Hawaii. <laughs> I will stay in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and no, go to Hawaii. It's nice. It's 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 cold out there right now. You go to Hawaii where this where the sun is shining and the water is beautiful and and it's lovely. And here's a ticket. Take the ticket and go. Uh, I, I think I better stay. You can't go to Hawaii if you won't take the ticket. Mm -hmm. There's only one way mm -hmm. to go. And I think that's what it is. It isn't. I don't want you to go to Hawaii. It's the you won't go. I'd love you to go. Please go. So I will forgive you, but you can't experience my forgiveness if you won't acknowledge a need for it. If you don't think you did anything wrong, you're not going to want forgiveness. You won't want to go to Hawaii. And, and just so in the gift of forgiving someone else, if you, if you don't want to be close to me in that way, if you don't want to have the gift of forgiveness in your life, um, well, God can't make you. Can't make you want something you don't want. So, no thanks, I'd rather be angry and estranged. Well, you know, that is a choice many people do make because, because what makes forgiveness so uh, impossible for us is the way anger functions in us over time. It, it latches on, it, it lands in the heart, and I think it makes like a tumor there. And over time, it develops its own blood supply. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty soon, it can't be removed. Mm. It's gotten too deep. It's become a part of you, and, and you feel as if you die. And you know, there are tumors like that. that can't, they're inoperable tumors. You can't excise the tumor because you'd kill the patient. Mm -hmm. And there are such tumors in the physical body. And I think that there, the that anger and the holding of a grudge and lack of forgiveness is a tumor. It's a growth in the spiritual body that you can't, you can, maybe when it was small, maybe if right at the time you could have said, okay, yeah, I forgive you, but, but you didn't. And then, and then it grows. And then there you are stuck with it and maimed by it, mm. but dependent upon your maiming so that you can't, you can't get free. And so when Jesus says, you need to forgive all these times, and you think, oh no, what am I going to do? Well, I think what he is saying, you know, yeah, I'm giving you an impossible task, but you are not without help. The impossibility of this task for you should tell you that it is not a task. It's a gift that I want to give you. You don't have to do this impossible task all by yourself. I am going to do it in you. Mm. So, so then if we could say, yeah, the, the anger that I have from this hurt or the shame that I have from the thing that I did, the, the, the tumor that I have has become inoperable. I can't get it out myself. That's true. So, as with all of the things I cannot do myself, I need a power greater than myself to do it. I'm not alone. We are not alone. If we were asked to forgive on our own, yeah, that would be a counsel to despair. But we are not alone. God is, stands ready to give us this gift. And throughout this time of talking, I want to talk about how God gives us this gift and how we can learn to, learn to accept it 
learn even to want it because I don't know I, I know in myself that when I have become dependent on an anger when it has become so much a part of me or shame that I sort of don't even see it that it just feels like a part of my own body mm. I don't even know enough to want to be free of it I don't know I'm in jail and so so it's it's impossible for me to ask to be free because I don't know that I have a problem. So, so it looks to me then like everybody else has a problem, and 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 I because I can't see myself. So, so I think what we'll be doing today is talking about pre preparing to receive the gift, learning even to want it, and. Becoming aware yet again, we've been told this so many times, but we forget it a lot, that, that the, 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 the sins that we have in us, the incapacities we have in us, the, the lack of ability to forgive, does not make God not love us. It makes God want to help us, and we have help. You know, when you talk to an alcoholic who is in recovery, he will tell you, that he was drinking forever and he might have lost a career and a family and his health and his job and everything else and and as long as he thought that he he needed to stop drinking on his own um he didn't he couldn't because he couldn't he had this this growth this tumor of a demon of the 19th century called alcoholism the demon rum didn't they mm. and it's because it functioned like a demon it was stronger than he was mm. well you know the demons are stronger than the people in the new testament and Jesus is stronger than the demons mm. always. So, yeah, they're stronger than we are. Sure, you know, we're human beings, but he is stronger. So the, the lack of forgiveness that we experience is, like all of our deficits, really an opportunity for us to come closer to God in asking for help. And that, it makes us better than we were. And that's paradoxical. You mean this thing that I had, this sin of mine that I couldn't forgive or wouldn't forgive or that I could not get free from my own shame, that that bad thing was a means of grace? Well, yeah. All of the terrible things in life, they're terrible, are a means of grace. Some alcoholics that I've met have said to me, you know, I'm glad that I'm an alcoholic because I would not know what I know now if I had not had the experience of recovery. So, and, and some of them who have said this have been people who lost a lot. Um, others have said, no, I'm not. I wish I were not. It was terrible. And, you know, yes, it, it was terrible. But, but had it not been for that, you would not know what you now know. So I think the bad things in life are still bad. But God uses every bad thing to bring some good. God doesn't undo the bad. It's, it's, it has happened. It's part of history. And some things that we have lost, we cannot get back. But, but we can, we're still here. Mm -hmm. And we still, we still have a life. And we still have choices. And whatever has happened in our past, we still have today. And we still have the future. And it belongs... To, to me. My future belongs to me and to God. I can't really do much about what happened in the past, but I have a lot to say about who I'm going to be now and who I'm going to walk with. So I think it's hard for us to choose life sometimes because you're just so used to death, but, but, but we can still, and we have help. We don't have to do it all alone. Barbara, thank you, and uh, I just think you've given us a, a lot to work with in that time. Oh, and there's so much more. <laughs> well, you do have four more sessions. <laughs> and folks, uh, Excuse me. in no particular order, I just invite you to uh, come into the conversation at a place that um, was, um, that glimmered for you in Barbara's presentation. Who would like to begin? I'd like to begin. Thank you. I was struck by the fact that you brought to light the power of choice. We all have the power to choose life 
And in that case, we also have the power to choose the gift of forgiveness for ourselves and for others. I believe that each day is a new, a new life to someone who's wise. Each day we can choose to forgive, make forgiveness a way of life and not a one-time event. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have the power to choose. And, and what I'm going to be saying as we move along is that sometimes our power to choose is impaired and we don't realize we have the power we have. We think we have to feel the way we feel because we've always felt that way. Well, no, you don't. There's, there's a lot of things you can do besides what you've always done. So I think one of the things that Jesus offers us is options. He, he, often, he often flies in the face of what everybody thinks is true, you know, and, and encourages people to question what the, the commonly received wisdom. And, and that's what making a choice is. And I think that it's so hard for us to know that we can choose. You know, I'm thinking of, I can't remember who told me this story, but it's, it's about a, it's a sort of a psychiatrist story, I think, a therapist story. It's a guy, he's, he's sitting on a stove and it's hot. So he, and, um, and, and so he says, you know, I'm on this stove and it's really hot. I need to, I, I need to get cool. And, and somebody says, well, you could get off the stove. Well, no, I mean, what I need is, could I get like ice and put it down here so it wouldn't be so hot? Well, you could get off the stove. Well, could we, could we maybe, could you adjust the temperature of it so that it wouldn't be so, well, you could get off the stove. Um, some, well, sometimes we just don't know we can get off the stove. Hmm. You can just be somewhere else. You can just do something else. And we, we carry things around and burden ourselves with them because we don't really know we can put them down. And he says, Jesus says, come unto me, ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Go ahead, give it to me. Put it down. Well, I can't. They're mine. Well, yeah, I know. Put it down. Oh, no, no, I can't. These are mine. Yeah, they're yours. Put them down. Um, <laughs> I guess... Um Barbara, you know, to that, I, I guess I have a question in my mind, which is why sometimes we have this sense that we deserve to be punished. Because I think it can come from that, that you feel like you deserve to sit on that. Oh, yeah. So where, where, where would you say that comes from? You know, I think it's when they were trying to make us civilized when we were little. Mm. They told us that if you are good, good things will happen to you, and if you are bad, bad things will happen to you. And so then when bad things happen, you think you caused it from that teaching when you were little. And it's, you know, you, nobody over five really believes it in, in their intellects, but I think in our hearts, that message sticks. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they were trying to make us behave. And this, the scheme of reward and punishment was something that worked. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but I'm not sure it works as well in adulthood. And it makes us cling to the idea that we, we deserve not to be forgiven. And that works the other way too, that, that the person who has offended us deserves not to be forgiven, does not deserve our forgiveness. But again, I don't think that anybody deserves forgiveness. It's mm -hmm. a gift. But we're so into, do you deserve it or don't you? Did you earn it or not? Or are you going to get the reward or not? And I suspect that that is really not the way God works. But I think it's, we think it is. But I think we're mistaken. And it's the thing we need to grow out of. But it's because we were taught it at a very young age by people we love and respect who were just trying to help us not be horrible <laughs> and <laughs> misbehave and, and make life crazy for everybody. Um, we absorb that lesson and maybe too well and can't now allow it to grow and change in us uh, as adults. Do we, do we buy the notion that we can be perfect? I think we buy, you know, the notion that we ought to be and take ourselves to task because we're not. And we think that if we ever acknowledge the capacity for imperfection that will just goof off and become lazy and won't even try. But mm. there are reasons to struggle for goodness besides 
um, getting an A mm -hmm. in it. There are a lot of good reasons. Love provides a reason that the competition of perfection never gives you. I wanted to, Barbara, uh, bring up uh, what for me seems a, a, a deep conflict, really, that, 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 that bears on here, which is the, the opposing value of to forgiveness, of justice. I mm -hmm. think that, 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 uh, that my desire for, for justice, my desire to see, you know, uh, the right done either by me or by somebody else is a strong demand and, and I think one that, that even God understands. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I don't, it's hard for me to imagine forgiveness that doesn't involve the sacrifice of justice and so and I think that's one of the things that makes it so hard I, I you know we don't I don't want to let go of my demand for justice and I sort of you know in and in but I understand if I make that an absolute then then uh, life doesn't go on life doesn't work but it's mm -hmm. it's it's not easy to let go uh, if I feel like I there's some injustice done to me or to someone else. Um, to someone else, you know, and, <coughs> and, and maybe we see that in somewhere like Syria or, or the, you know, uh, uh, you know that, that we say, oh, well, you know, no one can let go of the demand for, uh, for justice. And so there's no possibility. So I wonder, how, how do you address uh, that conflict? Isn't it, does that make it more complicated? It certainly does. And it's, it's probably... Um it's maybe our biggest stumbling block. Um, it feels to us, if we talk about forgiveness, and we'll say more about this, if we talk about forgiveness, it sounds to us as if um, we're just saying, well, then you don't have to pay for your consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, justice doesn't have to be done. We'll just, you know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that forgiveness has nothing to do with acquittal. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is not exoneration. Forgiveness presupposes sin. You don't have sin if you don't have guilt, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you don't have forgiveness if nobody sinned. Mm -hmm. um, why would you? We wouldn't be talking about forgiveness if we weren't not talking about the guilty. It's for the guilty. So, um, well, I can, you know, if I forgive him, then he's just going to go free. No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about a guy who is now dead, but he was a chaplain for many years in a forensic hospital upstate. What they used to call them hospitals for the criminally insane. Now they call them forensic hospitals. And uh, people are remanded to these hospitals. Um, they are, they number one, have broken the law. And number two, they are mentally ill. And they, um, but you don't go to these places because you ran a stop sign. You go because you were a violent criminal. So they, they raped someone, or they assaulted people, or they killed people. Um, they are dangerous people. So that's why they are, they're incarcerated in this hospital. If you and I want to sign ourselves out of a hospital, we can do that against medical advice. They can't do that. They are, it's part of their sentence. So he was with these guys for many years. This was all men. And he was with them for years and years. And one of the things that he developed over his time there was a thing that he called the forgiveness clinic. And he would take, he could take 12 guys over a period of two weeks and they would meet every morning. And, and they did a lot of things. They studied scripture for, for stories about forgiveness, like the prodigal son, like Jacob and Esau, so many stories in scripture about forgiveness. They, um, they talked in their sessions about the times that they had been forgiven, which for a lot of them weren't many, and the times that they had extended forgiveness, which probably were even fewer for most of them. They made a searching moral inventory. They made a sacramental confession with the chaplain, who was a priest. And... So they did a lot of things around forgiveness over those two weeks in the mornings, 12 guys. And at the end, they had a, a, you know, a kind of a graduation and received a certificate that said God had forgiven all their sins. Hmm. 
-hmm. Now, remember that these people weren't thinking straight. They were mentally ill. And so it was important to, to let them know that although God had forgiven their sins, the state of New York was not <laughs> finished with them yet. And they were not now free to go. They, they had to continue serve, paying their debt to society. Mm -hmm. um, there are many cases in which society cannot afford to, to let things go on as they are. The can, society cannot let things go. But that's different from saying that we do not forgive. Yes, I forgive you, and you still have to be off the street because we are not safe if you are on the street. And so I make a division between God's capacity to forgive and our capacity to forgive as a gift from God and the, the workings of justice that must play out. Mm -hmm. uh, society has a duty to, to make uh, justice um, as present in its midst as it can be. Mm -hmm. And that we forgive does not absolve us of that duty. Um, it's, it's part of life together. So we often think when, when you say, I forgive you, I'm saying that's okay. No, okay has nothing to do with forgiveness. You don't forgive things that are okay. You don't have to, they're okay. Um, but forgiveness is, what it does is admit the person you are forgiving, or maybe you, back into the human race. Mm -hmm. But maybe as a member of the human race, you may still have a debt to pay. And we all pretty much have to pay our own debts. We pretty much have to pay for what we take in the world. Mm -hmm. I have a question, if I might. I just found that um, when things turned around for me, um, I knew that God forgive, would forgive me. I knew this. What I found was the hardest thing to do was um, to forgive myself. Yeah. And um, for a the long time. The universal perpetrator, the yeah, self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, eventually, you know, as time goes on, you, you can let it go. But um, everybody forgave me. Right. You know? But I, you know. So you were the last man standing on yeah. the forgiveness chain? <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. was okay with you but you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Took a long time, mm. you know, and, um, but once you do it, and you can forgive yourself, you can forgive all the things that you did or that have been done to you. It's like dropping this big weight. Well, it frees up a lot of space here mm -hmm. that you can use for something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think about it um, often about forgiveness and anger and actually that tumor that you talk about and what gets me is knowing intellectually that it's forgiveness will free you up. Mm. Forgiveness will um, let you see and experience the world and God better. Challenge is knowing that and working on that. And doing that. And allowing, and that, and allowing to that to happen. We want the prison we're in. Mm -hmm. Do you know this experiment about the rat? It's, it's a depression experiment. He's in a, he's in a cage. And, what is it? He's in a cage, and he's in the cage, and he's in the cage, and he's in the cage. And then they leave the door open, but he stays in the cage mm -hmm. because, um, mm -hmm. because he's in the cage. And I think that we just are accustomed to what we're accustomed to, and the devil you know is better than the angel you don't know. And so you, you stay in it. I think, I think you're not alone in that. I think that that's kind of what we do. We, a body at rest tends to remain at rest, and if we just kind of want to stay doing what we're doing, even if it's unpleasant. And that's weird, but I think that is the way we are. Well, do you think there's an implication here? Uh, that, and maybe what we're leading to is that the grace of forgiveness is what ultimately will give us the ability to fight for justice. That there's a connection. That, that, that forgiven, we can fight for justice. The biblical 
concept of, of the good is different from the classical concept of justice. In, you know, our figure for justice is a lady with a blindfold holding a scale, like a postal scale, and it's the scale that you balance with weights. Um, you know, you've ever played with those, you know that the, they're precarious. Mm -hmm. You balance them just so, or you get on one of those at the doctor's and you finally get it balanced, but it sort of trembles. Mm -hmm. Justice is precarious. It's the good versus the bad, and which one's going to win, which one's going to be heavier. Mm -hmm. That's the classical emblem of justice, and it's on, um, you know, it's in all of our legal uh, stationaries <laughs> that we have. Um, that's a classical image. It's not a biblical image. It's, it's from Greco-Roman culture. It's not from Hebrew culture. Um, they rather um, equate justice with righteousness as a positive action of God, not a mutual restraint of evil, but a positive action of a righteous God, a God who fights for you, a God who is on the side of the people. Now, yes, the Bible is written by people who were pretty convinced that God was always on their side. Mm -hmm. That's another story. Mm -hmm. But, but <laughs> that, that God is on the side of the people, that God is actively seeking righteousness, is different from a blindfolded lady mm -hmm. who's holding a thing that goes like this. Mm -hmm. um, the mutual restraint of evil is a minimal standard for justice in biblical terms. And the, um, the more active, energetic pursuit of righteousness is, I think, the more biblical understanding of it. And for us, then, when we take a look at forgiveness, it can kind of set us free from uh, the Deuteronomic, to use a nice long word that means, you know, what you did, you're going to get back. You're going to get punished for what you did. Um, that's sort of, well, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what justice is. Um, well, Jesus actually says, that, no, actually, that is not what the divine justice is. Mm -hmm. The righteousness of God pierces that and, and pushes beyond it. Um, if all we do is, I'm not going to hurt you anymore than you hurt me. Well, it is a balance, but is it necessarily a, a loving thing? So I, I'd just as soon hurt you, but I won't because then I destroy the balance, isn't a, a particularly moral approach to justice. Um, rather, the energetic pursuit of the good, the, the loving conviction mm -hmm. that the, the good of the other is as good as my good, mm -hmm. and that, that, it, that I should be, the, the good of the other is as good as my good, mm -hmm. and that I should be passionate in the pursuit of it. There's a passion in our approach to justice that I think is missing in what we receive, what we have received from the classical world about what is legal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are perhaps confused what is just mm -hmm. with what is legal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to break in there and, uh, and bring this session to a close, this conversation to a close. There's so many places that we could still go. Mm -hmm. Thank heavens we still have four sessions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so folks, uh, I'm imagining that uh, y your conversation will be stimulated by Barbara's teaching and the spontaneity of conversation that emerges from that. And so um, over to you. You have time now to uh, grow this conversation further, to use the study materials as you will. So, blessings as you continue with the conversation that has begun here. Over to you. <laughs>